So what I figured we could do is sort of survey. I could talk you through this plan that I drew up and give you the context and we can see where to go from there. Um, try to explain how these parts of the compiler work. So let me first pull up the plan. New tab to new window. Let me share it. This okay, you all can see that? Yep. yep. So, yeah. Um, first question. I assume you all read the RFC, right? So we kind of know the general idea of what we're trying to do. Uh, yeah. Yep. Okay. And how familiar are you with how the compiler and how the Rust language, but also the compiler handles closures and things internally? Uh, not that familiar. Close okay. to zero, I would say. All right. So let me give a little like, before we go into the details of what the RFC is saying, let's do like a, um, a little intro into, into that. I'll start with, it's not, it's not that complicated. I'll start with like sort of what, what they're like at the language level. So when you see a closure like, uh, make some variables, you know, if I have, if I have a closure like this, um, what this winds up getting compiled down to, you can, Conceptually, it's kind of a struct. Mm -hmm. And well, first I'll show it how, how you might imagine it to be, and then we'll, we'll bring it down to more like what the compiler actually is. Uh, I guess that would be an I32, technically. Um, so, right, so we're going to kind of make a struct, mm -hmm. and then Constructing the closure is basically yeah. be creating an instance of this struct, right? And then there's some impl of yeah. Um, this much, I guess, is familiar enough. Uh, and so, oh, right, that's the basic model. But what the compiler actually does is slightly mm -hmm. different. Um, It actually makes, it does make kind of a struct-like thing, uh, but the struct looks a little different. For one mm -hmm. thing, it has, it has this type parameter. Uh, you can't actually express this in real Rust, I guess. <laughs> uh, but it has, it, has, it has some special type parameters in here. And one of them is a tuple like known to be a tuple, which has for each of the captured variables, like x and y, it will have their type in there. So what that means is that the type would look something kind of like this, if that makes sense. Um, okay. Yeah, that, and that makes sense. There's various reasons that we do it this way, but it, it's just kind of how we encode it. Um, and then the other type parameters, actually, I'm going to pull up the Rust C course here because it's helpful. The other type parameters encode other information about this um, struct. And I'm assuming you're not that familiar with how Rust C works either. Uh, no. Yeah, not particularly. So let me just, I'll dive in the middle and then I'll pull my way back out. So this is the documentation. This type closure substs. Um, this basically, let me just throw in this link here so it's easy to find later. This basically defines, the, the, got some utility functions for working with the substitutions of a closure. And substitutions means the values provided for the generic arguments, right? So I guess these, these types are the closure substs. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, might as well include that. So, um, so you can see there's this list. Uh, it 
the interesting ones, we'll ignore this first set anyway. There's, there's, these, there's basically three parameters, three types, the closure kind, the closure signature, and these types of the up, up variables is our name for captured variables. Um, and the closure kind is this really hacky thing where we just, we use like a number. So we want to record if that closure turned out to be basically which traits it turned out to implement. And we do that by encoding, I don't know, I think, I don't know what it is exactly, but like FN is I8 and FN mute is I32 or something like that. It doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, so that just kind of records for us what, what things the closure implements. And then this encodes the closure signature. So the actual type would look something like, in this case, the closure signature, it doesn't take any arguments, right? Yeah. So, and it's, I'm just going to call this I8, or sorry, uh, this would be like CKCS. The actual type here would be like I8, maybe, or whatever it is that says it implements the FN trait, mm -hmm. and then the signature, and then the types of the upper. So, so that, that's kind of how the compiler encodes these types internally, but you can see it, it maps pretty closely to, to the, yeah. um, what, what, yeah, the high level one. Yeah, the high level one. Um, and what we are going to, so now let me just explain a little bit more about finish, what this closure subs thing, how that works in. So just to show you where this comes up, in the compiler, when we represent the types of things, we do it with this. This okay. type. Um, uh, and there's a bunch. If if you kind of skip through to the kind, you see these are all the different kinds of types in Rust. And one of okay. them, one of them is closure. And so. Each closure has a def ID. That's just a unique ID that we give to every definition. Um, so this type would be an instance of tie closure or tie kind closure rather. And the ID would uniquely identify you know, this expression basically. Whoa, what's happening here? Sorry, got pulled off in another window. The ID kind of identifies, oh, it came from this expression. Um, and so forth. Uh, let me find, them. and I don't think I have to go too much in depth about that at this moment. Um, and the substitutions are what I just talked about. So the subst ref, those are like the list of substitutions, um, which is the list of type parameters. And you can call as closure to get uh, to sort of view them as a list of closure substitutions, as opposed to a list of just substitutions for some other kind of type, because um, that same type substref is used for all kinds of things. So, so that's how the compiler represents closures internally. And I don't know why. I, let's see. Trying to decide why I chose to start there. Well, now what I want to say is basically what we want to change here, right, is well, this, the other part of what the compiler does is it has to figure out there's a couple of things that are going to have to change if we're going to implement this RFC. For one thing, we currently do some analysis, we, but we assume that there's one, this tuple has one type in it. We, have, we basically assume there's one field per local variable that we access, and therefore the tuple has exactly one entry per local variable that we access, right? And we need to break that association because we're going to have to, um, we want to support, you know, if we had, if we had a closure like this, We now want to have, we basically want to desugar this so that instead of capturing the tuple, it's capturing these two fields of the tuple. And that means we're going to wind up with, oh, let me put this as rest. We're going to wind up with, uh, 
And I, you feel yeah. the answer. And the, the annoying thing is, this is where I have to fit you a little bit more about how the compiler's pipeline works. The annoying thing is that this information is not going to become available until relatively late. Let me think. So I just had an idea that I'll catalog for later. Uh, so the way that the compiler handles closures and, and just in general works is during type checking, um, so when we when we type check a function, we uh, when we see a closure expression, let's see if I can find the code where this happens. Somewhere like this. Um, when we see a closure expression, we'll wind up invoking check expert closure. But don't worry, I'm not expect the idea of dumping all these details in here in case it's not clear is just that it's stuff you can follow up on later and have some survey of what's going on. But the idea is when we see the closure expression, we, we type check it and we can kind of figure out its type. Um, and we actually don't know a lot of the details yet. So we know, currently we know that it's gonna have, we know how many, uh, at least before we do this change, we know how many upvars there will be, but we don't know their exact types. And the reason for that is we need to do this analysis, um, which we call the upvar analysis to figure out how they're captured, which depends on how they're used within the closure. So like in these examples, we're only reading from them and you see that I captured them by, by reference. Yeah. Right. But if they were getting moved, we would have captured them by value. If they were getting mutated, we would have done a mutable capture. And to figure that out, we kind of have to know there's a bit of an annoying dependency because we kind of have to know the types, enough of the types to figure out what's going on. So let me show you what I mean. Like if we had an example like, um, suppose we have a vector and we have a closure and it's calling v.push. If you don't do until you run the type check, you don't really know what this method push does. It might just read from V, right? but it might also mutate. Um, or it might move it. You don't know. You have to look at the signature to figure it out. Uh, and that would tell us that based on that, we can see, oh, actually this closure needs to have a mutable reference to V. And in fact, we also also know that um, we know, so that tells us like, uh, this is called the upper analysis. It would basically tell us uh, that V is captured by and mute reference. And also, though this isn't that relevant at the moment, that the closure C implements fn mute and fn once, but not fn. Um, is, do you know why that is? That all makes sense? Okay, if the answer is no. Uh, why, is, why is it both fn mute and fn once? Okay, good question. Um, the reason is that there's a kind of hierarchy here. So, so you got you got the three the three traits right. Um, Fn means you can be called many times at once, so to speak, with a shared reference. Uh, and that's because that's because you um, you only read things. Yeah. So you're kind of be able to be called from as many 
from a, from a wide variety of places because you do very few things. FN mute means you have to be called with a mutable reference because you mutate things. Um, and so in this case, you can be called from fewer places because you do more stuff, right? And the interesting thing about this is uh, that if I have something that implements FN that only reads things, I can also treat it as if it was FN mute, right? Because I'm basically being more conservative. That makes sense. Yeah. I can call it, I can say, well, I could have called this from a shared reference, but I have a mutable reference and I'm going to use that instead. Um, and FN once says, I can be called at most once, yeah. right? Um, because I move things. So I'm kind of phrasing this a little confusingly, I guess, but my point is anything that implements FN also implements FN mute and FN once, because if I could call it many times, I could surely call it just once too. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and similarly here, right? Uh, and so it's always, it's always kind of a, you implement that one and all the ones below. Okay. Yeah. Um, but so we do this analysis and it tells us what they do. And, and the way that we handle that in the compiler, that what that means is there's a phase, there's a period of time where we don't know what traits the closure implements, right? We know that it implements some of the function traits, but we don't know exactly which ones. Um, and we don't know it's full, all the types uh, of its up bars, because we don't know if they're by value or not. Um, and we, so we have a period of uncertainty. Um, and the way we express that is we have this idea of inference variables. Is that a term you've heard before? Uh, is the idea to use them like some sort of forward reference C++ that uh, they get resolved later? Yeah, basically. So it's kind of the key building block of type inference, right? Is you can create a, an inference variable and it, it represents some type that you don't yet know, but that you'll figure out later as you type, do the rest of your type checking, hopefully, right? And until you figure it out, so inference variables have two states. Uh, they start out unbound, meaning we don't know what it is. And then at some point they become bound where you, you now have assigned it a value and then it, it never changes again. Um, and so what we do for the closure type, you know, I mentioned they have these, these various variables. So for a closure type, some of the values in its substitutions are variables. The way it works today, it would be like, Oh, this question notation is um, just means inference variable. <laughs> uh, like, so you would start out with this is how it works today. We kind of this is what we know when we first create the closure. We know that it, you know, not very much. <laughs> we know that it has some kind, but we don't know what it is. It has some signature, but we don't know what it is. But one thing we do know is that it has a tuple of a certain arity. We know how many up bars there are, uh, right? That's, that's true today. And that's what gets expressed there. Uh, and then what we'll do is later, so those, those, close, those inference variables remain unbound until the up bar inference runs and it assigns them a value, right? And I'll, I'll point. So basically, when, after we've analyzed the body of the closure and we saw what it does, this, this, this will run after we've done all the type checks. So we know everything now. We know what push is, uh, it's the MU itself. And then we can figure out, for example, that we need to assign this to the value that is, corresponds to FN mute. And we have to assign this to the value for an AND mute capture. Right. Um, that's kind of the idea. And um, yep. How are how do we actually like uh, calculate the size of like the upward tuple? Because uh, can we not just modify it to not actually try to compute the parent that actually owns members? If that makes sense. Um, 
Yeah, so just to be clear, or I think you're saying, or one of the things we're going to have to change in case is we're not going to yeah. know how big this tuple is until we've had time to do the analysis. Uh, yes, but how do we know the size of the tuple today before we do the analysis? Because from what I can see, the user still does not actually provide this any information to figure out the size. So right. yeah, that's if a good we question. can, yeah. So the way we know that today is that we haven't, we don't need, before we do the type check, <laughs> yeah. we do name resolution. Okay. Which means we've looked and we've seen which local variables. That makes sense. Is it referenced? And so we have that information. That's a very good question. And we have that information in this query called up bars. Okay. I don't know if you know what a query is. Uh, I, I think you had that in your document, so we looked it up a little. Yeah, I did. Um, so a query, yeah, so a query is basically just a lazily executed function. Mm -hmm. um, and here's the query. Uh, and so when you invoke up bars, mm -hmm. what it will do is it will analyze uh, the body of the closure and see which local variables it references and it gives you back a list. So it doesn't need to do the type check to do that. And, um, okay, so I guess my follow-up would be, so when we see a local variable is accessed and let's say it's, uh, do we at that point figure out, like I assume we do that it's actually a member of a local variable than actually a local variable itself, if that uh, makes what I'm, so instead of having like, let's say p dot uh, like, like over here, when we're, when we're doing this uh, name resolution, like what we see in code is actually that we are accessing p dot x and not p. So can we just not reduce the amount of work we do to figure out which actual local variables owns the member to figure out the so, length of the. Right. So I think what you're saying is, if I understand, we could when you said over here, I guess maybe you meant like in this example. Yeah, exactly. We could like have we, seen that there's tuple.0 and tuple.1, yes. for example. Yeah. That's true. However, there's some complications. Okay. Um, let's put some notes on here. That was kind of this dummy field. Uh, let, let me table that question for one second. Okay. Uh, why do we not know, or why can't we figure out how many elements are in the tuple uh, by syntactic analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll answer the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, I think the answer is maybe we could, but there is one complication, which is sometimes uh, one problem is that there's different aliases or like different ways to spell equivalent paths. But we might have something like, suppose you have a variable who has the type ampersand mute u32, u32 or something. Okay. And then you have a closure that accesses, uh, let me make a better, better name, just some nested tuples, okay. Mm -hmm. And I have a closure that accesses star v and I don't know, v.1.0 and star v.1.1. Um, now, like, uh, all of these are actually based on star v. Yeah. But you can't see it here. And it's, you only know that after we've done the type check and we've kind of figured out, oh, V is a pointer, so actually there's an auto deref. Yep. Um, so one problem is, yeah, we don't know. It, and we pro I think ideally we would only capture uh, Star V. Yeah. And the other reason, which is similar, is that there's some limitations around drop. If I have a struct, it has a uh, drop and blind. Drop. 
you can't move out of that struct in Rust today. Like you can't move out of fields of that struct. Wow. Because if you think about it, you, you either destructure the whole thing or you don't kind of, right? Yeah, right. Because like, how am I going to run the destructor when some of the fields aren't there? Yeah. Um, so now if I use a closure in Rust today, that's, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Because, well, not drop x.v, but maybe x.v.len or something. Yeah. Because, well, let's make this a move closure just to make it clearer. Um, capture x. But we might want it to, or if, 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 if it didn't implement drop, we probably would want to capture x.v. Yeah. But it does implement drop, so we probably want to capture x. And we can't really know that without knowing types involved. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I understand what you're going for. My question is more like when we do our first pass before we do any type analysis, why don't do basically capture all information that we can from the closure. So basically we are uh, over here. Okay. In this example, we just say, okay, we will be capturing X dot V dot len and we have, uh, okay. I guess my point is more on the fact that, uh, the number of variables that we capture uh at like just from a syntactic analysis will always be more than than we actually uh need to really capture yeah. yes so so we can use that to capture more information early on and just uh sort yes. of reduce that information in a smart way once we actually have the types what we could do that's what i meant by dummy fields that's exactly right we could we have an up we could figure out an upper bound and we could make that many elements in the tuple and then maybe we don't use them all and we just make them unit or something. Uh, yeah, basically. Yeah, we could do that. I don't know if that's really going to make our lives. Well, it might make our lives somewhat easier. Because that was one of the first steps that I was encouraging Blitzer to do was to, it it's like, it's not that, it turns out it's actually not that hard to not know so I guess the answer is we could do that, but it would be less nice, uh, depending, although that might not be true, depending how hard it is to deal with the fact that we don't know the rarity of the tuple right away. Because basically, assuming we do it the way I originally was expecting, mm -hmm. and the only thing that changes is that instead of having it be a tuple of inference variables, it's now just an inference variable. And in fact, it sort of removes a special case, whereas before we instantiate everything with instance variables, except for this one. And I'm going to show you where that is in the code, actually. So this is the code that creates, it's kind of complicated, but it okay. creates that, uh, it creates uh, that substitution. Yeah. You can see here, it says somewhere, where does it do that actually? Oh, right. If, if it's the one for up variables, then I make a tuple. Otherwise I do this. Um, in some ways, the code would be nicer if we didn't have that special case. Um, uh, but on the other hand, if it proves to be a pain in the butt, um, maybe we just let it go. <laughs> I think you're right that we could upper bound it. It's not that big a deal. Uh, yeah. Basically, if you go on line uh, 96, or I guess what used to be line, can you scroll down? No, 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 back on the. Uh, yeah, mark down. I think around line 96. Uh, so yeah, 96. Basically, what I was thinking was we just capture that we're capturing star v, v.1.0, and star v.1.1. And basically, then we can reduce that list. Yeah, I think that's right. So we could, we could get some upper bound from syntactic analysis. Um, so it would be like, as you said, in the case of, uh, in the first case, we would guess three captures, but wind up with only one and unify the other two variables with unit. Um, that, that would work. I don't have a super strong opinion about it, except that I would like to try the other way because it seems not too hard and maybe nicer but um okay yeah no me. that's fair yeah sorry i derailed you from no. where you were going but oh, oh it's good 
also means you're following, which is always helpful. So the, yeah, where was I anyway? So I guess what I was saying is in terms of the plan, let's go back to the plan. Now we've kind of got the, the high level view in some sense of how closures and things work today. Um, I'm gonna do the first step is going to be, and this is true regardless of how we handle the, the size of the tuple essentially, that there's a bunch of code that currently uses that up bars query to get the list of up bars. And that code should all change because what we wanna be doing is producing, type check should produce a list of captured paths. And we wanna read the output from type check instead of reading this other query that doesn't depend on type check at all, right? And so what I, what I kind of described here was first we would rename the query to like raw up bars or syntactic up bars or I forget what I called it. Mention that thing, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and then we can kind of go through and um, just, it turns out that like the, the actual format of the data right now is the same. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty small refactoring where basically we take every call to this query and turn it to this call, right? And it should be a, should work more or less. Uh, but then the advantage now is we can change the structure of this, of this hash map and we'll have to refactor those, those code of course, but then, you know, we can make them more general. Um, Wait, so what, can you scroll, scroll up a little? So, uh, so like where, where are we changing the query? Like what we actually query? So, oh, you froze for me. Hello? Sorry? Oh, yep. can you scroll, scroll down where you actually change the query? Like, so what, what, what the first, like what originally it was doing was it would return the list of up parts for that uh, closure that's defined by that def ID. Mm -hmm. uh, now, are we planning on storing that type, like this information directly in type check tables or do we still want it to be associated with uh, like, what's that called? Uh, clo the closures itself, because I'm not sure how uh, type check tables work. Yeah, or, so that's a good, good question. So, so, what, so what is type check tables? Type check tables is basically the output from type check <laughs> and it okay. describes the type of every expression and a bunch of other bits and bobs of data that type check figures out like how many auto derefs you get at each spot and stuff like that okay um, and one of the things that it contains which blitzer added earlier is a list called upvars list um, and so so that is right. So one other thing I should explain. When you get the type check tables, you don't get the type check tables for a closure. I'm doing here. But what you're actually gonna get is the tables for the enclosing function item. Okay. So if we scroll to my example here, where oops, where's my where's my hack MB? No, this one, yeah. Uh you know, all of these, like these closures are actually embedded in some function, right? Uh, yeah. And when I asked for, the type check tables work at the level of functions like this. Okay. So when I, and that's because, oh, let me read this, but, um, so when I asked for the type check tables for this, I actually get the type check tables for the innermost and closing function. Um, that makes sense. And, and so that's why you have a map here that goes from the def ID of the closure mm -hmm. uh, here, from the def ID of the closure to a list of up bars used by the closure. Okay. Because if there if there were more closures, there might be more entries. Those would be also. Uh, okay. So if I okay again, uh, let's say uh, can you go back to your refactor where you have the refactoring? Yep. So 
basically tcx the type table uh, tables dot def id is going to be the same for all closures that are defined within the same scope yes like the first part and the second part uh, is just now specific to that very closure okay exactly and i use the same def id here because no that I, makes sense both it's the, the same ID. closure okay yeah it was yeah the fact there were two def ids was what was confusing okay it makes sense because of the same scope the first bit is actually just the same for multiple okay. line entries and this is a query so it's memoized so you can just call it as many times as you want and yeah change. um and right so i looked over all the places that we invoke this up bars query and there's not that many that's the good news okay. and most of them i think are pretty straightforward mm -hmm. the only reason they're the reason that things get complicated has to mm -hmm. do with the dependencies uh, within the compiler. Basically, you can't have cyclic dependencies between queries. That makes sense. While I'm computing the type check tables, I can't use the type check tables um, yeah. for a given, you know, for the same def ID. So the problem is these these bits of code are these are these are exactly the code that the upvar analysis uses. The analysis that figures out which, uh, how the up bars are used within a given closure. Okay. And so they can't use this query because if they did, um, well, that's the, they're the functions that are computing the result of that query. Uh, so yeah. we'll have to handle them differently, but we can ignore them for now. Um, and pretty RS is annoying because that's the pretty printing code. And that gets called all the time from everywhere. Uh, We'll probably just have to change how closures pretty print because we may not have the information available that we need to keep the current pretty printing and that's okay because it's ugly anyway. Um, so uh, These ones. Uh, I think these. Yeah, this just actually wants to be the raw up bars. In fact, okay. um, Is that just that's just the renaming and like the dummy variable part or just trying to figure yeah. out. Okay. Yeah. These are these, basically the, these, these four are all part of type check, right? You can kind okay. of see that in the name of their, the crate they're in. And so they probably don't want to change for now. We'll, we'll come back to it, but this stuff all happens except for pretty printing all happens after type check. So it's okay. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. How much of the work this part do you think is parallelizable, especially let's say once we are done with the type check part? Um, like just, just saying because you're multiple people and especially now with COVID pair programming is a little harder. Sure. I think I side note that, well, I've never used it, but I've heard the VS codes like pair programming uh, tools. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Uh, I think I mean, this stuff can be done in independent PRs. Like each of these okay. is, a, is a totally independent. Yeah, that's what I was saying. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's good. It probably won't. I think it would be worth, like the actual PR here is not very long. It's maybe okay. literally one line for each of these files, but it's a good exercise to do it because it kind of, you know, uh, it gets you familiar with how PR, the whole PR process and that's how that works. Yeah. Um, no, maybe you've already done that. Uh, this renaming, you know, that's also its own PR. It's kind of orthogonal from these, I suppose. There might be a bit of a git like merge dependency, but other than that. Um, so the next step is going to be actually a more substantive change. It's more interesting because I didn't write any details for it because it's a little more complicated, but. Basically, that's where we want to go and say, okay, now we have this list of, of up bars. Mm -hmm. um, and right now what happens is we map from, so the here ID, that's the identification of some expression within mm -hmm. the Into body. The, yeah. and the up bar ID is like, basically identifies a local variable in the outer context. And what we want to do is change this notion of a place. And a place is a mirror term that we use. We call it a place. It's kind of like a path. I think it's more common to call it a path, like a.b.c. 
But the idea is it's a place in memory. That's why it's called a place. So it might be a field, it might be a local variable, but it's some location. And luckily, there's actually already. So we can't use the mirror place because mirror is built after type check. Uh, but there is this other version of place that's already been made for us very nicely. Um, it didn't exist when we last tried to do this, this work, but now it exists. Someone, uh, Matthew Jasper, I think refactored it. Uh, and this is basically the same idea of, of this place concept, but expressed in terms of the here, so the AST based or the AST like IR that we're using in type check. Um, and the structure is it has a base, which is like the start of the path. So that's usually a local variable, right? You see that it could be an up bar. We're going to, yeah, we'll keep this for now. But, um, and then projections, these are like the dot B, dot C, dot whatever. Uh, it's not as detailed as it could be. We'll probably have to refactor this a little bit. But the idea is a D ref. So you start out with like, um, I'm down to the bottom here. Given something like star V dot B dot C. This would be a base local variable V projections. Uh, uh, D ref and field B and field C. And so what we want to do is we kind of want to refactor the list of up bars so that instead of capturing um, where am I? Here's my upper map. Instead of mapping to an upper ID, uh, it's going to map to um, oh my god, what are you doing? That's what I want. It's going to map to a place. So, because that's just going to list, and right now the places will always just be local variables, right? Um, Nico, I had a question. Uh, how does the HR ID translates into DEF ID? Uh, it doesn't. Oh. There may not be a DEF ID for every here ID. The idea is, let me give an example to explain it. Imagine I have a, and I'll do it in here. Um, DEF ID identifies like the top level thing. Um, and the here ID identifies something within a def ID. But, and sometimes, at the moment, sometimes these things also have def IDs, which I'll explain. Like, closures are a good example, actually. But so if I have this, right, the function foo has a def ID. Let's call it D. And then this is actually like some AST, like, or rather some here, high, which by the way stands for high level intermediate representation, in case that wasn't clear. Uh, as I imagine, it probably wasn't. And um, this might be, you know, whatever, a let statement with like a destination pattern that is X, you know, it's some kind of, some kind of tree. And each of these has a here ID. And if you look, uh, actually at how here ID is defined. You will see that it has an owner, which is the def ID. And then within that def ID, it has a local ID. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like, if this was D, this might be like D0, and this might be D1. Uh, and so forth. Um, you see, here ID is just it's the ID of some node inside of an ID. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so we want to remap. Yeah. So we basically want to refactor this up our list map so that the values are here places. 
Um, and that's, we will, I won't say much more at this moment because I think we're, first of all, we're running out of time. And secondly, I probably dumped enough information on you for the time being. But uh, um, what that's going to involve is Right. currently only capturing local variables. So this is kind of an increase in expressiveness, right? Now we can express uh, capturing star V or V of zero or whatever, right? Um, and uh, this will mean that we have to change a little bit of uh, the code above to be more general. So like, for example, here, in libbrus see mirror build after you all, you all know what mirror is i've just been saying mirror but it occurs to me that may not uh, middle intermediate representation yeah yes um it is it is it's the middle intermediate representation and it's specifically it's like uh it desugars a lot of the details that, um, that you see and like the here matches reasonably closely to what you type it's somewhat different, but it's pretty close. But the mirror is, is quite a bit desugared. And and especially around closures, this is true. So when you get to the mirror level, this picture of closures that I showed up here where it's a struct with field, this is exactly what you see in mirror. Um, okay. The closure body is completely separate in a different, like, uh, different in a different mirror. There's a mirror for every function body and then closures are separated out into their own mirrors, right? Um, and so that that mirror construction step will read these kind of currently is reading uh, what's the local variable and what's the mode that I capture it in and then it constructs this these arguments right based on those two bits of information what it would now do is say what is the mode and what is the place that I'm capturing. So instead of just being ampersand x, it might be ampersand x dot y dot z, right? Um, but probably we would start with those things are always local variables. So nothing really changes. There's no deep change, but it just is more able to handle it when we generalize things. That'll involve some amount of refactoring because we have to make these data structures more general and we have to. Um, uh, the, in write the code that can convert them into a mirror and so on. It shouldn't be too hard, but it's going to be some some interesting work. So that's sort of once we've got that far, then we've done a lot. <laughs> but we're getting now to like at that point we're getting through the uh, we kind of are able to do the optimization, and I think we'll be we'll turn it on. We'll be able to turn it on and have it work. And it'll have to be feature gated because it changes the semantics of some aspects of Rust, most notably when destructors run. And then we're going to have to figure out, like, play around with. Um, like, I would consider that a good endpoint, to put it clear. Like, in terms of if you're thinking of projects and so on, that's it's not that the feature is ready to ship, but the feature is ready to be experimented with. Uh, but then uh, the next step before we can actually ship it is we'll have to figure out how we want to deal with those breaking changes and whether we want to put them in an addition if they actually matter or, or what and maybe if we need to do any optimizations because now we're going to be capturing the way i've described it we're capturing a lot more we used to capture just the local variable now we're capturing potentially many paths from within the local variable so the closure will get bigger it'll have more pointers in it it'll be less efficient uh but more more ergonomic and that might not matter at all, but it might matter. In which case, we want to optimize it somehow. That's all. For the uh, ideally, from a like a program perspective, like should drop really change, like when drop run should really, I guess, affect the uh, actual program, like in in the sense that uh, let's say we take the example like that you had earlier, where we take ownership over. Uh, a vector or where, where we take ownership of like a part within uh, like a part of the uh, member that we are gets destructed a part of the sorry structure gets destructed would require the whole structure to get destructed 
uh, wouldn't that not align with the current uh, implementation itself? So in the event that you've implemented drop, in like in this example that I gave, uh, yes, that you probably still capture X and not uh, capture X.B. So nothing would actually change. Yeah, exactly. Uh, a more interesting or a more not interesting, but a more a different example might be, let's say this one. Um, yeah, so now in the, in this code today, knowing, um, what did I get for being half, half inventing, uh, in this code today, uh, so today C is dropped here and it drops to bold. Yeah. But if if we do this naively at least, when you move tuple dot zero under this change, it will only move tuple dot zero. And tuple dot one will stay where it is. And so tuple dot one would be dropped at the exit from this block. Uh Yes, but oh, so within tuples we can drop uh, entries separately. Yes, does that make sense? Okay, okay. Um, this doesn't matter for this. Like this example is a good case where you probably don't care. Your yeah. memory gets freed either way. It gets freed a little earlier or later. You might care, but you probably don't. Uh, but um, but sometimes drops have side effects, and then it's very visible. Okay, that's fair. So I think, I think what we would do. Well, yeah, I think my preferred plan would be that we, we make the change. We, do, we change when drop runs, but we do it on an addition boundary and we warn people, like if, if when you're converting between additions, if we see a closure that would capture, like that will change drop order. Mm -hmm. And we, we probably look a little bit, make a good heuristic. Like in this case, we might change, not make any change because we're guessing you don't care, but suppose it had side effects, then we would rewrite the code to insert like this. Um, but this is all for next year to figure out. <laughs> My goal for this year is that we are actually in the place to, like that we have the breaking change implemented, not the fixing change. That, okay, that can be that's fair. Uh, but if we did that, you know, now we preserve the semantics of the program and then the user can come back and say like, I don't really care, I'm gonna delete that line or maybe I do, right? Um, like maybe we add a fix me comment. Yeah. Or whatever. That's the whole point of addition. Or or, or you know, just this like we could have a compiler flag that just enables this fix up. Yeah, we already we have that machinery for 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 new additions. So we, uh, okay, yeah. we made a number of last when we released Rust twenty eighteen, we made a number of small changes like this that kind of technically they change your code, but you probably don't care. <laughs> um yeah. and so we would make the edits for you. And then you can sort of figure it out. Uh, okay, I have one more question as to how deep an analysis we want. Uh, so uh, if I can, let, let me see if I can share my screen so that it makes it a little easier to for me to explain. Uh, right. Okay, I think you would have to stop sharing screen for me to share screen. Oh, let me do that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, let's start one. Okay, I'm just gonna, uh, actually I'll just send the, okay, I'll just explain my code. Uh, I would have to kill the session, my Zoom session. Okay, so basically, uh, let's say, uh, so we have within our closure, let's say a call to a print point. So and point is our uh, member like a local variable. So point will get captured and uh, it will do its thing. Now let's say the print function all it does is it only accesses uh, point with uh, p dot x. So its point is basically an x y i thirty two pair. So it only captures p dot x. Now in this case, do we want um, only p dot x to get captured, or do we expect the whole point p to get captured? 
Let me just share what I think you said. All right, can I send a Here's message or a file mean. for this? Okay. Uh, okay, so I have, okay, if you look at the chat, I send the whole code that I have in the Zoom chat. Oh, all right. You could also edit the HackMD, by the way. Oh, um, oh actually, I can share the file as well. Okay, that, I think code awesome. works. Okay. Yeah, so I have this here. So basically, uh, I have... Yeah, we can't... No, we don't cross function boundaries. So in this case, we would capture all of P. Okay, yeah, so we only just see what... Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, because the analysis will become way too expensive yeah. otherwise. Yeah, that there... Uh, after we complete this work, <laughs> you know, on my list of like things I'd like to do eventually is to enable this sort of cross function. Sorry, you now completely cut out. Uh, can, can you repeat? You completely cut out for me. Uh, I'm just saying in the far future, maybe a few years from now, this is on my wish list. Okay, yeah. But it's much harder. All right, I have to run to another meeting. Uh, I hope this was helpful. I hope you're still yeah. interested. Oh uh, um, yeah, no. Uh, yeah, I think we are. I'll still discuss this with my team and thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna post the recording uh in the Zulip stream, I guess. Okay. Um, that works. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.